The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our first ever quarterly webinar. Um, hopefully, this will be one of many, and we look forward to sharing uh, various things we're doing, giving you an opportunity to give us plenty of feedback. Um, as you heard, um, you guys, um, as listeners, your microphones will be muted, but if you have questions for us, there's a, a question box for you, which you can happily write um, anything in there you would like. We're going to take questions at the end, and it's likely that um, as the um, presentations and um, content goes on, you'll, you'll have more questions as, as time moves on. So we'll hopefully talk for about um, no more than half an hour, uh, perhaps a tiny bit longer, and then uh, um, give you an opportunity to, to have those questions answered. Um, it will all be done uh, from the point of view of audio, just from hearing our voices. Um, it's just uh, more straightforward when there's dozens of uh, people on the line. So um, without further ado, let's um, begin. The first things first is we would like to um, change the slide. So the reason we are holding this webinar is to emphasize how important it is for you guys to keep in touch with us. So we want to remind you of all the different ways you can do that. So here on the screen and also attached in the handouts, we've um, attached the, um, the presentation slides for you. Just a reminder of all of those different ways you can get in touch with us. Um, the other main reason for holding this webinar today is that we're right in the middle of a feedback um, uh, process on the Slinger Signaler or Rigger Signal Person Standard uh, that's due to be published later this year and we really want your feedback on that so there'll be various points today when we'll uh, remind you about how you can do that. Um, there's a draft copy of the standard that's attached as well the second of the two handouts. Okay so just to introduce us um, I'm Ralph Savage I'm responsible for communications here at GWO I've been with the team since February last year. I'm here with uh, my colleague Jakob Björn Nielsen. How are you doing yeah. Jakob? Hi guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, as you can see there's a bit of information on the screen about me so I won't spend time on that but more to express my gratitude for you guys uh, showing up so we can engage a bit more and provide an even better product for the industry. Thank you so much. Okay and finally we also have a guest panelist today. We're Delighted to have David Goodfellow with us. Um, he's uh, head of QHSE for Northern Europe at uh, the Nordex Group. Um, David uh, is, is, is on the line, but he's um, just going to um, wait for a while. We, we'd like to put him on sort of as the headline act, if you like, so keep everybody uh, waiting to, um, to hear what he has to say. So um, I'll quickly move on to um, uh, the agenda for today. So uh, first up, I'll go through our market report, the Q1. Uh, numbers from the Winda database. Um, shortly after, Jakob Björn will um, give a training development update. And um, after that, a very brief note on the main events and um, calendar dates for the rest of the year. Then we'll, um, we'll hear from uh, David Goodfellow at Nordex. And uh, after that, uh, you'll have plenty of time to have your questions answered. So moving on, the market report. So many of you will have seen, uh, we've published a little bit of uh, data on our website and here are a few more graphics to illustrate the trends in uh, a module by module um, picture. So here the um, basic safety training standard modules. Um, looking at the, the graphics, you can see that there are seasonal variations. It's very much a, uh, a winter spring um, peak. Um, given the, the Northern Hemisphere's weather cycles. Um, but just to, to provide a bit more detail on those numbers, um, Q1 uh, 2019 versus Q1 2018 in these modules, there was a 22% increase in the number of certificates awarded. Um, the same quarter in 2018 against its previous quarter in 2017, there was only a 7.3% increase. So you can see quite a rapid rise. Um, in the volume of uh, BST modules being taken on a quarterly um, comparison. 
And then we come to uh, basic technical training. This has been an interesting story. We've now started to see some really rapid growth um, and uh, a rise to the extent that there were approximately 5,000 modules completed in the three main modules, electrical, hydraulic, and mechanical, in the last 12 months. Um, the installation is uh, uh, very new, so we haven't got any data to share uh, in regards to that standard yet. So hopefully we'll be able to share a bit more with you when we look uh, at half year and, and full year numbers. <clears throat> Um, another interesting figure is the most straightforward one to explain, which is how many people have a GWO training certificate. Um, this is a global number, so this is every person, um, and it's just touching towards 80,000 now, and that's a 4.2% rise just in the first quarter. Um, we don't have any geographical information on this, although we can pull out that kind of information, but we will... Um, share that in more detail probably in the half year report um, but we'd be interested also for your feedback if there are any particular regions of the world where you um, where you see a, a particular need or an absence of gwo training or we can we can pull out numbers on the basis of what nationalities the delegates themselves have but also where the training is taking place <clears throat> who are the largest um training providers this is uh all um, modules, so uh, BST, BTT, all of the new uh, enhanced and advanced um, training standards. And we can see a few changes there. Again, um, you can refer to these um, tables in, in the handouts that you received. Um, and, uh, you know, always interested in, in receiving feedback on, on what these numbers mean. <clears throat> and finally, one that um, a table that's particularly interesting as it ties in very closely with the GWO mission to um, create a, a safe working environment in uh, wind energy around the world. Here you'll see a list of training providers who were certified just during the first quarter of 2019 and roughly half on that list, I think it's 14 of them, were based outside the European Union. You can see many of them in uh, Latin America, also in India. Uh, South Africa, um, and we expect to see um, an increasing number in North America towards the end of this year as well. So um, we're we're exciting to it's excited to see those numbers grow. The current total number of GWO training providers is 314. Um, so yeah, always keen to to see that increase. Um, that I think is the final slide on. The window numbers. So I'm going to hand over to Jakob. He's going to talk to you about the standards development uh, program at GWO. And um, over to you. Cool. Excellent. Um, what I'll do here uh, is uh, I'll start with a project overview, uh, a bit more uh, generic, but also have a few comments to to what we've gone through, where we are right now, and and what we're currently looking into a bit. And then I'll deep dive a bit more into the Sling and Signaler uh, and, and have a focus there. Um, so let's see how this goes. So what you're looking at right now is, um, is a slide that I've uh, kind of piggybacked on from our normal presentation to our training committees and uh, executive committees, et cetera. So it shows that we're all in green, which is brilliant. And uh, we can also get an idea of what we completed uh, not long ago. At Wind Europe in Bilbao, we launched the blade repair. We also launched the installation module and two uh, uh, two reviews. Uh, I believe that was fire awareness and uh, and first aid uh, that we launched in Bilbao. Um, well, currently, we have a, a review of uh, manual handling and working at height uh, ongoing. It's a bit different than uh, what we've been doing so far when it comes to review in the sense that we are uh, running it as an, uh, a North American working group uh, to engage even more with that side of uh, the industry and the market as we're trying to engage more with doing these webinars. We're actively on many different fronts trying to involve our key stakeholders uh, in both development but also sharing uh, knowledge. 
Um, there has been some rumors, uh, so I'll just spend a tiny minute on that regarding the manual handling and working at height, that the product from that working group will be a US only or North American only product. That is not the case. The uh, updated modules from that uh, working group will of course be, be uh, globally implemented. So it'll be the same throughout, but it's one of those questions that kind of pops up. Every once in a while when we do different things, it kind of it leads to uh, to questions and uh, please as uh, mentioned and when we started send us an email create a ticket or whatever you reach us on linkedin and whatever you want and 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 put forward your query we would like to answer it um the other project which i'll get more into in a few is the slinger signaler uh, that's currently in development it's being launched uh, at the end of the year um we're a bit ahead of schedule, which is brilliant, uh, and the standard is already in hearing. Having it in hearing means different things. I mean, we have it on an, as an online survey right now, uh, but we are also putting it into hearing with the North American committee and the Chinese committee. Um, so we're really trying to, uh, to kind of grasp the whole scope of our stakeholders here. Um, Another project that we have going on, and it's a bit of a more in the early stages, is training material, which is a fairly generic title. But the context of that, and I'll get back to that a bit later, is that we uh, have created something called the auditor qualification training, uh, because one of the focus areas has been uh, to upskill the auditors so they have a better idea of how to recognize good and bad training when they audit our training providers. But for that training to be even better, we are uh, aiming at creating training material. It will more than likely be animations, et cetera, of good training, bad training. How do you ask the good questions, et cetera. Um, furthermore, we have a, a TC project, which uh, in essence is a study of who uses our different modules. And it's quite interesting. It, it's a bit more of a, it's called scientific approach than a training standard as such, uh, but it's 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 good to to deep dive into why are people using our standards or why they're not, etc. So we can improve uh, on the uh, quality aspect, which ties nicely into the improvement. Uh, we are currently doing uh, numerous uh, efforts. We are updating uh, how our Training standards look. Uh, we're also translating the standard into uh, Chinese, which will be launched uh, in in half a year's time, uh, and doing a lot of other things. So we're kind of trying to pick up from having expanded heavily, and now sorting our foundation a bit more. Just it's a bit of a what do you call it? Not gardening, but uh, just. Clean our own house, so to speak. Getting our ducks in a row. Getting our ducks in a row, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mentioned the translation of the GWO standards. Another and the last on this list, a very cool project, is that we're working on global alignment. Um, a year and a half, two years ago, GWO were primarily doing training in Europe. Now we're in Asia, we're in North America, we're in Latin America, etc. And a year and a half ago, the standard was functional to the sense, or in the sense that it says European norm, this and that with the equipment, et cetera, or when in doubt, please follow this European standard. That's just not enough anymore. So we're going through a pretty heavy revision and this is it's complex stuff because there's a lot of legalities and, and different uh, bodies that we need to consult. So it'll be a, a prolonged project will be done in 2020, but we're working through all different modules to update them with new tables with standards, norms, and, and reference systems for everything in it. So, and in simple terms, the output for that will be that if you're an American training provider, you'll see standards referred to that you recognize. Yes, it'll be the ANSI yeah. number something instead of the EN yeah. number something yeah. in the American sense, yeah. at least. And then it'll be different in Russia and Australia. And yeah and China and so on. Um, but you'll see actually, it was starting with the standards that we're gonna be pushing out in the future, the Slinger Signaler, that will already be updated when it launches. Mm -hmm. So so it will be done in the new format. 
yes. in globally aligned format. Yes, it will be, yes. And there'll, there'll be, uh, I mean, you can see it when we get to it, but there'll be um, a table at, in an annex that covers, uh, for instance, um, equipment, et cetera, mm -hmm. with different countries. Yes, but it's something that uh, Alex uh, Booker, my colleague, is working on heavily at the moment. Good. Let's uh, deep dive a bit into the uh, Slinger Signal. So, um, sometimes when we uh, present new products, we kind of put on huge graphs and timelines, et cetera. And of course, I'll put in a timeline after this, but I think it's important to kind of address the two core questions that most people have when we say we're doing something new. First question is, well, who are we doing it for? Second question is, what are they capable of doing once they're done? Um, and in the left-hand side box, the, the blue one, that kind of covers the target group. It's fairly generic, but I think there's something that are important to look at anyways, because it says personnel working within the wind industry, conducting slinging techniques and signaling during simple lifting operations, meaning lifts conducted based on a lifting plan covering known hazards. So while it is fairly generic, there are some key bullets in this text. First of all, it says personnel working within the wind industry. It does not say wind power technician. So we're broadening the scope a bit. Uh, that's the first key thing. The second key thing is that we're talking about simple lifts based on a lifting plan covering known hazards. So this is not a heavy lift module. That is not the aim or the target group for this training, yes? Um, I understand that uh, known hazards, that's an interesting term um, and how you deal with that, but it is what the industry, in, in the sense that our members represent about 90% of the, the turbines put down uh, worldwide, says that's, that's a good, good cut for it. So if you look at um, what someone having completed the training are capable of, uh, it kind of depicts quite well that uh, what we're dealing here is what happens uh, from, um, let's say, just a second here, is what happens from, um, from the lifting attachment and down. So attaching and detaching the load, initiating a, a direct safe movement of the crane. So signals, et cetera, and also to understand their role and responsibility is really important. One of the things that we're finding here when we're creating training is there's a lot of focus on technicalities, uh, but the whole planning and clarity of who does what is really important. It's a different topic or different training, but uh, one of the things that we'll see when we launch the updated manual handling is that they're more focused on, um, on the planning phase. So plan before you lift. It's important to know the techniques, of course, but the planning part of it and understanding who does what. Uh, and there, of course, will be handling of the accessories and uh, a lot of other different things. I won't read out the last one. Do you have it here? Um, I'm, I'm sure, Ralph, we will be putting up a video for this as well. Yeah, well, there's a copy of the standard, as I said, attached in the, um, uh, the handouts. And uh, in the follow-up email to this webinar, you'll receive a link to our survey so you can then have both of the things you need which is a copy of the standard and then a link to the survey so you can give us the feedback on whether you think the learning objectives are achieved in the standard as it's written or where you think things could be improved and uh, you know it's a really important process before anything like this is launched yes uh, so last thing i'll kind of mention about this is that we're we're kind of trying to progress and, and mature our product so you'll see when you go into the attachment and, and look at the standard, we're adding more stuff, more guidelines. So to sling a signal, there's a hand signal package attached. There's also a, an annex covering a generic lifting plan that can be used during the training, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of caveats in that saying, this is not an industry standard, it's purely to be used for training, et cetera, but we're giving more tools for the training providers to use when conducting the, the training. Hmm. So it's one of kind of, and uh, we, we think it's a bit of a highlight in what we're doing at the moment. Good. I think I'll move on a bit. Um, this is the timeline. Uh, as you can see, we just kind of completed it. We're into hearing now, which is also why we're talking about it here. It's why it's on the webpage. Uh, 
and, and different things. Based on that hearing and that, uh, we have a, a very cool survey monkey uh, thing going on at the moment. All the feedback we get that from that hearing, we'll be spending July updating uh, the draft based on that. Uh, early August to mid-August, we'll be doing pilot trainings. There'll be, uh, two, as I remember, two in Europe and one in the US. And then we'll go through our normal update and approval loop based on the, the findings from the pilot trains and we'll be releasing September, early October. Mm -hmm. And of course, implementing from, from there on. So that's kind of like the timeline. Um, the other one thing that's worth mentioning is that the draft standard can be used as a basis for certification. Yes. Obviously, depending on the important caveat that if any major changes are made, yes. it has to be referred to. So. Exactly. Pending that we find out that we need to do major changes based on the pilot trains. Mm -hmm. But yes, that's important. And, and we did it. Uh, it was the case with the blade training as well. Uh, and and uh, quite a few uh, training providers actually got certified that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, good reminder. So I'll do a bit of an update. And uh, it covers different things. Uh, some of it ties into what I already talked about from the uh, from the overview, uh, but other things are, are also it's a bit different because it doesn't tie directly into a new standard. Um, first off, I'll quickly show the review plan, uh, which kind of outlines how we how we have all the different modules lined up for a review. We have a system for that, and I'll explain that briefly. I'll talk a bit about bit more about the training material as mentioned earlier, a few words on the standard update and also the alignment project that uh, I talked about earlier. So let's see if we can do the next slide here. So this overview here is uh, the slide is quite busy. So one of those things that really shouldn't be used for training, but um, let's see if we can uh, do it anyways. So we have fixed dates or release dates for our uh, uh, updated modules. Uh, we do not have fixed date for releases of new training standards, but we do have for uh, for uh, reviews. So the core rule is that a year after we release a new training standard, we do a review. After that, we go into two year cycles. Uh, and, and, and we actually cut off the plan here on the right hand side. We have a plan that lasts until 2023, I believe. Um, but it's just kind of to show how the flow is and how it connects. So you have an idea. The ambition is to put uh, this or something like it on the website so you can go there and follow, so you can prepare as a training provider or as a stakeholder for what's kind of going on and what's happening. Um, I won't dwell a lot more on this. I'll just show you while we have released the new stuff that's on the left-hand side, and then you can see there's a year going, then we do a review. Other, after that, we'll have a two-year cycle, right? And it's in your handouts, so you can refer cool. to it. Excellent. Um, training material. As mentioned, um, actually, when I started in GWO, which, a, which is a, a year and a half ago now, plus a bit, um, my very first day actually for with GWO was in Hamburg at the Wind event. It went, it went there, and the uh, the site event um, really made it clear, both for me and, and the other people working in GWO, this that the focus is very much on the quality of the auditors and thereby on the qualities of the approved training providers and also the ones who are being approved who are perhaps not um, as skilled or proficient as they should be. So um, based on that, it, would, it was decided that we want to look into how we could uh, upskill the auditors and um, I wrote up a training standard together with auditors, internal auditors, and, and audit and compliance stakeholders here from GWO. And that training standard was uh, piloted in China, the US, I believe, and, um, and here in Denmark. And based on that, we released it. Uh, so it's changing how auditors can become uh, certified to audit training providers in different modules. Um, the legacy setup, which is still current, by the way, is that you uh, need need to have as an auditor to have the module have taken part in the, in the module itself as an auditor before you're allowed to audit it uh, and it's it's a certain percentage of time they need to have been in it etc uh, you can find that on our web page but we wanted to change that so say well 
instead of focusing very much on the specific and the technicalities of each module, we want to focus on the auditor's ability to recognize good training and to uh, to kind of to deal with that. Um, but so far, or, or and so far that's working really great. But we want to up the game somewhat, so we want to add training material that can uh, further help the auditors. And uh, we are kind of looking into a different ways of doing that. And and some of the things that there's a lot of cultural stuff out there, so we want to avoid a certain skin color, etc., or whatever of uh, doing the animations and language. Uh, so yeah, this is visual aids. Essentially. Yes, so visual, visual aids. animations or videos yeah. that. If we if we refer to something like what does good training look like, then in an auditor qualification training yes. process, we will be implementing some of this kind of training material yes. to help people see what that exactly. really means. It, it can, for instance, be a video showing how you ask a, a question correctly. Yeah. So instead of uh, everybody who hasn't done this, just raise your raise your hand, like right? mm -hmm. then you could ask correctly, saying who are not able to do this, please raise raise your hand or something. I mean, just using the correct question technique, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, a scope extension of that and why we're spending a bit of time on this is that we are, or the ambition at least, is to also put this on our webpage so everybody can access it. Uh, and training providers, delegates and whatnot saying, how is it we actually do this? How do you flip a classroom? How do you uh, do practical exercises in the best and safest possible manner, etc.? Mm -hmm. So we want to make examples for that and materials for that. Um, I don't think I'll dwell more on the training material. I'm sure there'll be a few questions on that. Um, let's see here. I need to probably just click the slide here. So standard update, which is a bit of a, could be a bit misleading. So first off, we're not changing any content in the standards, but we want to make it more easily accessible and we want to make it more, let's call it pedagogically correct as well for, for the, uh, we should do that for the instructors. So one of the things that and it's quite tangible is in a lot of the current uh, training standards, we have bullets in them. And, and that's not really cutting it. We need to have a good referencing system. So all the bullets will be uh, updated. So they all either be numbers or, or letters depending on where they are in the standard, et cetera. So the reference, referencing system will be updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a more of a simple indexation process. Yes, yeah. very much so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a usability update. Mm -hmm. And also, because the standard has been created uh, like over f six years now, mm -hmm. we also kind of want them to look a bit the same and kind of have the same yeah, look and feel, really. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's so. bearing in mind the fact that nine times out of 10, these will be viewed on a, on a tablet or on a PC yes. anyway. We're not talking about flicking through paper documents. It needs to be yes. searchable and indexable like that. Yes, yeah. exactly. So. It will be coming, uh, and it'll be in September. Um, I'll be uh, connected to uh, to some uh, translation to Chinese, et cetera, and all the stuff that we're doing. Mm. But just a heads up, so it's really important to emphasize, we're not changing the content. We're just making it better and easier and faster to use. But as usual, if you have comments or feedback once yeah. it's published in its new updated format, then please tell us. Yes. So, um, yeah. Move on. Um, so, just a second. The alignment project. I want to spend a bit more time on it, so we kind of just iron it out because it's a uh, it's it's a big project. It's going to be taking a lot of time, but it's also important to kind of just dive a bit into the details. Um, the overall approach is that we want to be truly global we i mean as mentioned earlier we're spreading out from europe we're really going on into all the different regions so our material needs to kind of depict that and and the different regions that are, are coming up on this uh, north america really uh, really a lot of progress there uh, these days and we're starting to connect quite well to both the market uh, but also to the different organizations there etc and how they do things it's uh, it's a learning point for us so we're trying to really improve and connect to how people work there and and how how everything is is uh, put together so that's for the regions important and also i know uh, ralph you were recently in south america right mm -hmm. and brazil for instance booming 
So we want to connect and, and make our uh, training standards as usable as possible. Mm. There's a lot, a lot of different norms. So there's, there's legislation, then, then you have norms, and then you have standards, and, and all these different things, they, they kind of connect. So we want to update and make sure that the modules are relevant in, in all the, these aspects. Um, so if you have any experts in this area, if you want to contribute to this work, please reach out. Uh, Alex is working on it and, uh, and doing a really great job, but it's very specific and it's very uh, regional or, or national. So whatever kind of input that you guys can provide for us, it's very welcome. Um, one thing is to look up all the new norms, legislation, different things, standards that we're going to use, but we also want to standardize how it looks in our standards. That's a lot of standard words in one sentence, but in essence, and the honest take here is that some of our standards, because they've been developed across six years, when it comes to the sections where we deal with norms, et cetera, not fully updated yet. You saw our reviewing cycle. I mean, it's a, it's a four or five year plan, right? So, but for this one, we want to kind of give it one go. We don't want to wait the full five, five years for everything to be updated. This is an area where we're going to take all the standards and do it in one go. Um, one of the key focus here, is, as I mentioned, is the equipment. And you'll see that more than likely, and this has not been decided fully yet, so bear with me, we'll move the equipment section of, uh, into an annex uh, where it's a bit easier to put up a table for the different norms, standards, and legislation connected to that. Uh, the timeline is, as mentioned, 2020. But uh, help us out. Maybe it can be before. If uh, you really contribute a lot and and you engage with us, um, yeah, it's definitely not a one-way process, and we need input to come locally. Yes, um, you know, it, it, things things move much quicker because we have input from our Chinese committee and from our North American committee, and hopefully from other regional committees as well. So um, those committees are um, purely for for member processes, but but we we take feedback and input from from all quarters wherever we can, wherever appropriate. So exactly, yeah, cool. Um, let's see if I can find this here. Yeah, so I'm just going to very, very quickly run through what's coming up and then I'm going to introduce uh, David to you. So we have a uh, calendar of events and um, notable points for you to bear in mind. So the, um, the orange colored rows are uh, sort of internal meetings. This is just to keep you in, the, in, in step with how GWO operates. So our um, executive committee is, uh, um, comprises all of the uh, chairs of the committees and they will meet uh, at the end of this month. Um, and our general assembly, which is all of the member representatives meet in September to set strategy for the following year. Um, perhaps if there are mostly training providers on the line today, um, the blue points are important, um, in particular, the um, running out of the validity of old versions of the standards. So just to remind you, when a standard is reviewed and a new version is published, the old version is still valid for three months. So uh, 1st of July, BST version 11 and BTT version 4 will no longer be valid. So you will be required to be operating your training programs using version 12 and version 5 from those dates. Um, and then we also have uh, the current review, as Jakob said, of uh, working height and manual, manual handling review in BST is going to be published on the 1st of October. So any questions about these, um, these dates, uh, please feel free to get in touch. But I'm anxious to um, hand over to our guest panelist, David Goodfellow, who um, is uh, from Nordex, our newest member. And um, I will uh, David's actually going to present a few slides to introduce himself. David, if you if you're here and you want to switch your microphone on, you should be able to speak to everybody. Yes, have done. Okay, let me just make you a presenter. <clears throat> okay, so that should work. Um, if any people in the audience have any problem with audio or anything like that, please just um, mention it in the question box. But uh, David, over to you. So thank you. Um, I mean, clearly I'm going to introduce myself, but more more interesting for most people, I guess, would be the the company, what we're doing, and uh, you know, the, where we are, where and how we see our training needs. <clears throat> so hopefully you can all see um, 
I'm heading slide now. Um, my mouse isn't doing what I want. There we go. So I'm going to take you through who we are, um, whereabouts we are in the world, and um, sort of what we do and why we want to, uh, why we've chosen to join the GWO and what uh, our hopes and challenges are within the GWO. So who are we? We, we are um, the Nordics group, which is Nordex Aciona as a, as a logo, um, although we're more and more just relying on the Nordex name these days. So Nordex as an organization was founded in Denmark in 85, following various prototyping that had been going on on turbines for about three years previous to that. Um, Aciona as an organization was set up within the Aciona Energia group. Um, as, a, as a, an organization to manufacture wind turbines, so it's actually on a wind power, and um, both those organizations have been relatively successful um, in the industry, um, but recognized back in 2016 that um, there was rationalization going on in the industry and only the large players were likely to survive. So in 2016, Nodges and Aciona merged their operations um and since then um we're pretty much at the two and a half megawatt sort of level then we've developed three megawatt um and then four and we're now um just launched five megawatt class machines so uh, i won't go through all the rest of that detail um on this this is interspersed with uh, lovely, lovely arty pictures of our wind turbines, so you'll get uh, a good impression of the sort of um, area we operate in. So, where are we? Well, in terms of our manufacturing facilities, um, we have plants in most continents of the world, um, and you can see there a mixture of nacelle factories, blade factories, um, and tower factories. <clears throat> um, clearly, those factories will also do um, panel manufacturing, things like that as well, but um, that's the, that's the, sort of the key elements. And then, where do we operate in terms of installation? So, as you can see, we've got a fair number of countries coloured in. In fact, there are um, other countries that have um, we're moving into at the moment, like the Ukraine, for example, where um, that hasn't uh, made it onto that map yet. Um, in terms of installations, um, we've got more than 25 gigawatts installed and operational. Um, seven of that's in the Americas, um, Asia Pacific and Africa is five, and the bulk is in Europe, 13 gigawatts, of which Northern Europe is four gigawatts, Germany is four gigawatts, the Med area is three gigawatts, and Spain is two gigawatts. So quite a strong implementation in Europe, um, but also pretty active um, in a lot of uh, non-European territories. So what do we do? Um, as, as well as manufacturing, of course, um, we we're a project developer in certain certain um, countries where it makes sense to do so. So um, we're one of the leading developers in France. And we're also active in developing projects in India. Um, and then we have a logistics function. So all of those components that we make have got to be got to sites. We, um, we will quite happily take on balance of plant work, so civil works and electrical infrastructure. Um, and then that we do installation and commissioning of the turbines and then generally stay on with those turbines in a service capacity. So that's um, a slide showing our product range, but I think I've pretty much introduced that already. So in terms of what we do health and safety wise, we have a very much um, a cultural basis for our approaches to safety behaviours. So some of the, the things that we do to try and um, develop good safety culture with our people are safety contacts at the beginning of um, any significant meetings. Um, we have 
safety walks and talks by managers. So this is discussion based, not checklist based. Um, we, every person in the organization gets an annual safety refresher from their direct line manager um, to demonstrate management uh, leadership in safety. We have a number of campaigns where we use videos, online surveys, um, as many, really as many different media as we can to keep people engaged. At the moment, we're running a, a, a large positive poster campaign, so we're not putting up pictures of people who've been maimed and injured because um, our surveys of the workforce suggested that the, the guys thought that um, safety was actually fairly well run within the business so we didn't want to we didn't need a shock campaign but what we're doing is um, refor re reinforcing protective behavior so um, for example a, um, a poster that shows somebody's hands playing the um, guitar and um, the message is protect your hands at work for all those precious moments outside of work um, and the, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that we do do uh, um, some inter, a lot of internal technical trainings um, and, and we do have our own facilities to, pro to produce um, training, training videos and training materials on, um, on those topics. So why GWO? And you'll see the, uh, the um, safety poster logo and campaign creeping in at the bottom here. Safety is not a program, it's about heart. So why, why GWO? Well, I mean, for, for us, um, when we started looking at it last year, there was a, we were the only um, turbine, leading turbine manufacturer who weren't part of the GWO. Um, and yet, we're in an environment where convergence of national schemes and GWO standards has taken place. So the, the schemes that we've relied on have typically turned into GWO standards. Um, and there's partly because of that, there's been an increasing adoption of GWO standards across the industry. Um, and for the same reason, the um, a lot of our Nordex people were starting to get certificates on them that were GWO um, stat. Um, and you couple that with the fact that, I mean, we work in a very multinational industry and there's ever, an ever increasing amount of cross-border working going on, particularly with the, um, the market forces in Europe having meant that typically each, each country has been in the doldrums for a, a year or two while the markets settle out or they're waiting for a new um, financial scheme to come along. So typically people have been moving um, from one country to another for a few years, then on to another and so on. So portability of um, certificates cross border um, has been important. So opportunities for us and challenges. Well, we have a great opportunity to share our existing knowledge and experience with other members, but clearly also to um, share their knowledge with us and to learn from them. Um, Okay. Yes, I said qualifications we will be recognised across borders and to collaborate um, with the GWO to further develop training standards. Challenges, um, we have in, um, an inter training academy in Hamburg and an offshoot of that in the UK and we have to work out now how we align the training centre both physically and in terms of delivery with GWO. Um, clearly what we want to do is bring our supply chain with us. Um, in, obviously in a lot of cases um, supply chain is the same for ourselves and our competitors because generally we tend to use the same um, for example organisations to construct turbines. Um, but there were there, there will be um, a certain amount of our supply chain who we will now be saying we would prefer you to have GWO certificates or even we would require you to depending on whether it's appropriate or not. And then finally one of the challenges that we've got is how to manage somebody who's maybe done a GWO training in one country and learnt about the legal context of that training. How do we 
top that up as they move to another country obviously they don't need the whole training but how do we top up the the legal framework aspect of it okay so i mean that's all i've prepared um does anybody have any questions thanks david i have some questions if, if i can th throw in it's ralph here um one of the things we wanted you to be able to explain to um, people listening in is as a new member with a big workforce in dozens and dozens of countries, what does a new member organization actually do um, when it communicates the fact that you're now part of GWO, that you'll be looking to essentially, you know, audit the level of GWO training or otherwise um, across your global network? What steps are you taking? What processes are you engaged in in that? Okay, so one or two questions all wrapped up in one there yeah um so first one in terms of communication we've we've shared that out on our um corporate website um so everybody will have who go, who's been onto the intranet um over a week or so will have seen that news um up there um we have a we formed a project team consisting of myself um, and our two divisional HSE heads um, who are uh, looking at how we fully integrate with the GWO. So, for example, we're making decisions on who sits on training committees and um, it was another compliance type committee. Yes. And what the first, but the first sort of a real um sort of big piece of work is the, is actually understanding where we are i mean we we operate in around about 35 different countries um where we have organizational activity um so what we've done is created a, a questionnaire for each country based around the gwo um, existing training standards um and sent that out to each country to try and find out whether gwo is is even Sort of known and accepted, or whether it's um, it's sort of the it, we request it, whether we absolutely demand it. Do we actually train our own people to GWO standards in those countries, um, or indeed is there a specific country requirement which stops us training to GWO, which can happen? Um, so we're at the moment. I mean, we 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 only joined. In April, we're still in the process of collecting all that information. Uh, but the plan then is to do a gap analysis and look at where it's appropriate to move over to GWO standards. So that's that'll be a combination of where the um, the law and the culture of the country um, allow it, but also where the training provision is available. Yeah, and the other thing about working in such a multinational organization is the existence of local training um, in those countries we talked about it earlier on um, what does it mean to a business like nordex to see the growth of um, gwo training providers like that slide we had earlier on with 14 new training providers in multiple different countries what what benefit does that deliver to a global company like this well, I mean, when we move into a country, um, there's, there's two phases to it. The first phase is that we'll move in on a, a project-based approach, so construction side of things. Um, and at that point, to be um, blunt, it's it's not too important because an awful lot of the workers who come in who who will need that sort of training, uh, who are going to be involved in building the turbines and commissioning them, will be generally coming in from um, other countries. Uh, and we would expect them to bring um, GWO or equivalent training with them. However, we then develop a service organisation in that country and for us the ideal would be if there's a local service provider who can, um, who we can lean on to provide the training for, for our guys there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so um, we're looking forward to seeing that growth happen and to help support you. Um, I'm just going to switch the screen back. I think we're done with most of the um, uh, slides and things like that. So we'll now um, look into um, 
some of the questions that have been coming in and feel free to send a few through. Um, let's um, deal with one or two of the more straightforward ones. I think, Charlie, uh, your question about when Nordex became a member, that's been answered. It was very, very recently. So the difference is a, a something that is a, a, a watching brief um, for, for Nordex. So um, uh, perhaps we'll, um, we'll do a, a one year later kind of talk with you, David, and, and see how things are going. Um, beyond that, we had a, a question uh, uh, which is which is quite pertinent to everything that GWO does. Um, it's uh, will GWO, it's about the Slinger signaler. Um, so will GWO acknowledge certifications through National Commission for Certification of Crane Operators in the US, much like accepting uh, an AHA for first aid? Um, what this does is it points to a process that we call merit, but essentially it's a uh, the, the use of a, a tool, as David mentioned, um, the processes, a gap analysis is, is required to be to be carried out. So in this case, it would be looking at um, those uh, NCC, C, how many C's? N triple C O uh, training courses and seeing how they match up against the Slinger Signaler. Um, once that process is, is carried out, we can then assess whether there are any gaps. It could be that the training is completely identical, in which case we would be able to award a GWO Slinger or Rigger Signal Person uh, certificate for that um, technician having already completed the um, course. But um, without having uh, a way of comparing apples with apples, this is the process that we have devised. And, and we've, we've done that with a number of training courses that are created by our members. So. There are various training courses at Siemens Canesa and Vestas and other turbine manufacturers. Um, yeah. A good example is in Germany, um, there's a, a standard for first aid as well. And uh, you can go to a training provider there. They're both certified to uh, provide, uh, I believe it's called GGUV first aid and uh, the GWO first aid. And you can do one course because they match almost perfectly when it comes to learning objectives. To, then when you leave the training provider, you, you leave with two uh, certificates and they are equally valid and they're uh, matched against, against each other. So it's not something that we're adverse to do at all mm -hmm. uh, and we welcome it. But to be honest, I haven't kind of spent time to uh, to look into that uh, certification. So, uh, But if there, are, if there are US based training providers who are already training that course, it yeah. would be in their interest to find out how closely connected the two standards are and then sure. ultimately be able to deliver two certificates for the price of one. Or and I would recommend, I mean, we already have the draft out there. Go to the web page, yeah. have a look, yeah. see how it matches, reach out to us. Wow. And and we'll we'll take it from there. Yeah, and we can give you some some tools, including a gap analysis matrix, which allows a calculation to be completed, and the result is normally a, an actual percentage number. Is that right? Yeah. So, yes, it uh, is. So this you know the one training standard is ten percent longer or shorter or different from the other. We we match on learning objectives and um, and and we do it quite uh, methodically so it's uh, it's fairly straightforward but it takes a bit of work to do it but it's well worth the effort uh, you can mention that uh, Siemens Gamesa for instance they got I think two and a half thousand technicians merited uh, towards our BTT standard so they didn't have to do the training at all it just it was a matter of having the, the merit table done and all that and go through the process and then we did, did it in one big lump yes um, so we're, we're not going through these questions in any kind of order of importance. It's actually just sort of uh, which ones we can read in uh, in, in short order. Uh, I'd like to hand uh, any over to David while we have him on the line. Um, um, in the in the meantime, perhaps um, David, while you're on the line, we could talk about that um, gap analysis and merit process. What does it mean for a business where you have a you know what what are you likely to look towards would you would you like to have a a workforce in nordex where um you can have everybody trained to a gwo standard and bring some of them through as a result of a merit process what's um what's your end game here okay i, th I think as with any major change within an organization the answer to that will very much depend who you ask yeah. but um, 
I mean, as a as a leadership team in HSE, I mean, clearly the the vision would be that everybody has the same basic training, which is um, recognised across any country they go to. I mean, there there are practical difficulties with that, um, and there are sort of legal difficulties with that um, in certain countries. Um, but our our intention is that where where there's no um, blocker, we'll, we'll we'll take the easy wins first um, and convert training requirements over to GWO standards where we've got the local provider and as I say where there's no no major blocker to that. Um, I mean, clearly, we we also uh, we have we have a, a large training facility and we do a lot of our training, particularly our German training, in that facility in Hamburg. So it's very important for us to um, do a separate gap analysis that we're doing, which is in order to uh, do a gap analysis between the training that we're currently providing and the GWO. Um, we believe there's only one very small point on that, which uh, um, we, we need to um, sort out between between Nordex and the GWO. Um, but on that on that basis, um, of course, you know, once we've if we use a merit process and bring all over our, our existing training, then that sets a groundwork for that to, uh, for those people to be trained in GWO um, standards from from then on. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, I'm just going to try and we've got about three more minutes. Um, don't want to keep everybody for from, from, for the rest of the day. Um, we've got uh, some questions here about um, something quite specific about I think the Slinger case there. So materials in the standard yep. the provider needs to have could be similar to a wind turbine generator hoist. Uh, it's it's when you kind of look through the standards, we have a definition area, uh, and there we define what a crane is in the context of the training. So please uh, have a look at it, go uh, go check it out, and so um, it should be fairly clear. So I mean, that's the easiest way to use that. Okay. I'll transfer that. Um, a couple of general questions: one referring to the U.S. and another one about Asia. One asking us whether GWO training classes will be offered in the U.S. on a regular basis, and another one asking, um, uh, there's pointing out that there's still a relatively small amount of um, GWO training centres, given the you know the amount of installed capacity that's um, being put in across Asia. Um, in terms of the U.S., we we have a North American committee whose role it is um, primarily to um, promote the adoption of GWO standards in North America. Um, that's led by um, uh, the chairman of the committee, who's um, Brian Valencheck. He's uh, head of HSE for the Americas at GE, who are the market leader um, in that uh, area. Um, sorry, David. Um, and um, He's, he's very enthusiastic, uh, as are the other committee members um, uh, of uh, helping GWO uh, become the established training standard for uh, basic minimum standards of skills and competence. In uh, Asia, uh, I'm not aware of any local Asian standards that's, that, that are being used alongside GWO, but this is something that, again, we'll look into in the Global Alignment Project, where local standards exist. Yes. They'll be referred. You can say, as a general rule, when you go into a new market, uh, there are some uh, some areas that are quite interesting. I mean, also we can just look back a bit in history when it comes to uh, the wind power industry, right? So suddenly, uh, boat manufacturers, anybody working with composite materials, are relevant. Anybody uh, creating uh, complex machinery are relevant. So the whole mobility of the workforce and the, the, the skills, knowledge, and competencies, uh, it's it's also there in Asia. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a big market or something already in place when it comes to turbines. There's a lot of comparable skills and industries that are usable and also a lot of uh, training. So that's a good foundation uh, for uh, diving into DWO or uh, an advanced training. Um, so we're going to wrap it up. A uh, couple of questions about what's available in terms of um, what we've presented here. Um, David, I'm, I'm sure, won't mind sharing his um, slides, uh, if that's good with you, David. No, perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, please you know do do keep in touch and once again we implore you to uh, review the draft standards and, and give us as much feedback as you can on the um, the new uh, slinger signal rigor signal person training um, and um, please refer you know back to the materials that Jakob Björn has um, presented to you in particular about when the next review process for you know all of the standards is, is going to happen because that gives training providers in particular an opportunity to input via working groups um, and it's also relatively predictable because the reviews you know happen at the same time uh, during the year and the, the new versions of the standards are published at the same point uh, the 1st of April or the 1st of October so you know resource wise it's it's something that you can plan a fairly long way ahead um, and uh, again please just contact us through the uh, info at globalwindsafety.org address or um, you have our personal email addresses there as well but uh, uh, any way you prefer um, We'll also be out in person um, at Copenhagen Offshore um, in November and at various other meetings and conferences over the course of the next few months. Um, so on that note, we're, um, we're going to say goodbye and thank you all for joining us. And um, we'll do our best to um, answer any of these questions. If you actually want to just forward some of these questions to us uh, via the info inbox, we can um, we can answer them for you. It might be possible to type in a few answers afterwards. But um, thanks again, everybody, and um, toodaloo. Have a nice day wherever you are. I sound like a DJ, don't I? Yeah, a bit. All right, see you later. Bye, bye, right, bye. Thanks, Adler. Are we?